Hello and welcome to Oxford at Home and this is the first of what is going to be a series of I think fascinating talks from academics all around the University of Oxford during this curious period of lockdown. My name is Rana Mitter, I'm a historian of modern China but my role during this talk and other talks to come will be to host these events and help to uh, bring the questions and the discussion along. And today I'm going to be introducing my colleague Dr Lindsay Turnbull who is an ecologist with a particular focus on plants. Lindsay's engaged with a whole range of topics, but she's particularly interested in how plant species coexist. Yes, it can be red and to in tooth and claw in the plant kingdom, and also about these symbiotic, much more friendly relations between algae and other organisms. And that enables uh, various organisms, uh, apart from plants, in fact, to take advantage of photosynthesis, as her research shows. She often looks into why these differences evolve and what the consequences are for ecosystems. And recent projects have included questions of interactivity between plants and insects. Remember that insects, that's gonna come, uh, come up in a minute. And the effects of organic farming on biodiversity and plant growth modeling. So plenty to cover there, but you'd be glad to know that Lindsay is going to be focusing in and she's going to be talking off the back of a really interesting question. Because did you know, I did not, that just five groups of interest, uh, in, I'm sorry, five groups of insects dominate your garden. And can you tell the difference between bugs and beetles? Ah, you didn't know there was a difference, did you? Well, it's coming up to half term for many schools here in the UK. And so in this week's talk, we're going to meet what Lindsay calls the bug five and learn how to tell them apart. And there are going to be beautiful drawings by one of Lindsay's former students, Pandora Dewan. Now, while this is going on, I want you to select your own bug five, choosing your favorite representative of each of the five groups you'll hear about. And you can decide whether Lin Lindsay's bug five are in fact the best or worse than those suggested by the super rival uh, going on here, the entomologist Liam Crowley. So plenty to think about there. Now, the talk's gonna last about 15 minutes, then we'll have about 15 minutes after that for Q&A. Please send in questions either via the chat window, not the Q&A window, but the chat window on YouTube, or tweet them on Twitter with the hashtag, hashtag Oxford at home. And we will pick up your questions and throw them over to Lindsay after she's finished her talk. Please remember that all of us, like probably many of you watching are on our home Wi-Fi at the moment. So unless you're in South Korea, in which case you have no excuse, it may be a little bit uh, glitchy and droppy now and then. So just bear with us if we have to take a half a second or so to, to get back in, uh, in touch. And I think it's high time that we heard all about the Bug Five. Could I introduce Lindsay Turnbull? Lindsay. Well, thank you very much, Rana. It's very nice to be here on this very sunny, but also incredibly windy Friday evening. So sorry if you can hear the wind howling down my chimney from time to time. So my name is Lindsay Turnbull, indeed. Rana definitely got that right. And these are my roles at the University of Oxford. So I'm an associate professor in the Department of Plant Sciences and that means that's where I do my research, which Rana kindly summarised. And it's also where we give lectures and practicals uh, and also run field courses for all the biologists who are studying at Oxford. And in fact, the biology degree is offered jointly by the Department of Plant Sciences and also my colleagues in the Department of Zoology. So we work very closely together. But you'll notice on this slide, I've also written that I'm a biology tutor at the Queen's College, Oxford. And that's one of those sort of slightly surprising and quite confusing things about Oxford, if you don't know it, is that lots of people have these two affiliations. They're affiliated with the department, but also with the college. So what's, what, how does that work? Well, students, undergraduate students are admitted to colleges and they are under the guidance then of a college tutor. And that's me in the case of the stu biology students who come to Queen's. In fact, I'm one of two tutors there. And we normally have around six biologists coming in every year and I have to look after them and I have to be responsible for their academic progress and give them pastoral care and try to infuse and encourage them and keep their passion and energy for biology going, which most of them do bring with them, I'm really glad to say. And one of my roles as a tutor is to give them tutorials and those are small group teaching environments where we might have just two to four students and we can really talk about something in depth. And yes, they do have to write an essay every week, and that's one of the things we talk about. But we also talk about real biological things, and I bring in specimens, or we maybe go and find some specimens, and we have a look at them and have a think about them. Now, in this slide, you can see a plant, and that pink flower there is something that most people would probably be quite happy just calling a weed, frankly. You can see it only has small pink flowers, and it has slightly frilly leaves here. This is its leaves here. 
but it's kind of a special to me that plant it's important to me and that's because when I was a child I was very interested in natural history but my parents weren't natural history nuts they didn't know the names of everything but they bought me a book. They encouraged my enthusiasm. And they bought me a book called The Spotter's Guide to Wildlife. And I remember this book very vividly and getting it and being really excited and rushing outside and thinking, well, what can I identify? And there were all kinds of things in this book that were all the way from little plants like this up to basking sharks. I don't know how many UK children at the time would ever be likely to see a basking shark, but never mind, if you did see it, you could tick it off in your spotter's guide. And this was the first thing I identified and its name is Herb Robert. And I just remember that moment of discovery, of feeling really excited that this little weed that I'd walked over every day and paid no attention to, wasn't just weed, it was Herb Robert. It was a proper plant with a name. And once I knew its name, then you could find out lots of other things about it. And if you ever touch Herb Robert, for example, if you try to pull it up from your garden because you think it is a weed, then you'll notice it's got a really pungent smell and your hands get all sticky afterwards because it has what we call glandular hairs. And that's just a way of keeping off insects who want to eat it. So Herb Robert has certain traits associated with it. Once you know its name, you know that. Uh, it's in the geranium family, actually. Here's another geranium in my garden. This one most people wouldn't call a weed. It's geranium thiam. Uh, and you have to go and buy it in a garden centre probably if you want it, although it is a native plant as well. It doesn't self-seed itself all over your garden like the Herb Robert does. And it has different properties. So by knowing the names of things, you can find out more about them. You can't Google something if you don't know what it is. So that ability to identify and name things and classify them and organise them, that's a really big task that biologists do. And we're still doing a lot of it. And that's because although most of the things in the UK have names, there's plenty of things out there in the world that don't. If you want to name a new species, it's not going to be that hard. You just have to put some effort in, but you'll be able to find one. There's no question about that. All right, so when this horrible situation started with COVID-19 and we had to go into this lockdown, then I realized that my students weren't coming back and that I would miss them, frankly, and I would miss teaching them because that's something I love doing, and that I wouldn't be able to replace some of my teaching very easily. Uh, so I decided to make this series of videos called Back Garden Biology, and you can find them on the Queen's College YouTube channel or an Oxford podcast. And they were just a way for me to try to engage with the students and keep them in touch with me and with the biology that I know they love. So this is kind of one of those episodes, you know, met, tailored to this kind of format. So it hasn't got lots of video clips in it because I wasn't sure how well that would work over Zoom. So if you want to see those, you'd have to go and look at the real thing. But I have got these wonderful drawings from Pandora. I'm really happy to be able to show those. All right, so as Rana said, it's called the Bug Five. I obviously that's a bit of a pun on the big five when people go off to Africa looking on, for, on the safari they're often obsessed with finding the big five and they're not the most interesting they're just kind of big and you can tell your mates you've seen them. Now with the bug five the reason I'm calling them that is they are the most species groups they are the groups with most of the species so in the UK we have about 24,000 insect species and we have a re we have very few insects compared to many parts of the world so that's not a lot but it still feels like a lot. It's pretty daunting if you don't know what any of them are. But the good news is that about 97% of all of those species belong to just one of these five groups. And these five groups really dominate the insect world and they dominate your garden. So if you can start to identify these five groups and you're making a really big start in getting into the insect world. So this is what they are. They are the Hemiptera, the true bugs. They are the Lepidoptera, which are the butterflies and moths. They are the Coleoptera, which are the beetles. They are the Diptera, which are the flies. And they are the Hymenoptera, which are the ants, bees, and wasps. And I'm gonna take us through each of those groups and just go through some of their distinguishing features. So in at number five, this is the least species group, is the Hemiptera, or the true bugs. And what you'll notice about all of these names is they all end with this Ptera. And that Ptera means wings. Uh, and these are the hemi-terra. We call them hemiptera, but really it means hemi-terra. So it means sort of half wings. And this green shield bug is kind of showing that off a bit. You can see it's got a strange sort of construction with this funny little patch at the back end there. This green shield bug can be found very easily in gardens. And it was a bug I also remember finding as a child. You can pick it up, it's quite robust, it's large. It's a nice one to sort of handle as a child. 
And here's the drawing of it, and we can see it a bit more easily. And that hemi terror we can see quite well on the back of the insect. It doesn't mean half, it hasn't really got half wings. All insects have four wings, two pairs of wings attached to the middle part of the body, which is called the thorax. And the half wing thing comes from the fact that the first part of the wing is hard and the end part of the wing is membranous. My mouse doesn't seem to be working, so I'm going to stop trying. But I hope you can see that from the drawing. You've got a membranous part and a hard part. And on the right hand side, you can see the mouth parts of the bug. So all, again, the insect orders have different wings and they have very different mouth parts. And the true bugs have this incredible rostrum and that is a piercing mouth part. So they're going to jam that rostrum into another organism and suck up something liquid. And for plants, that would be sticking that into the pipes that conduct sugar around the plant. That's what they're doing. And that's what the green shield bug is doing. But some bugs stick that rostrum into other organisms. So there are things called assassin bugs that assassinate other insects. Next, the next most species group is the Lepidoptera, which are the butterflies and moths. I'm basing all these numbers on the UK, by the way. So this is number four in the UK. Worldwide, we still don't really know because so many insects are undescribed. This is a peacock butterfly, probably one of our most beautiful butterflies. They're around in the early spring. I'm not seeing them now, but around six weeks ago, I would see them charging up and down my garden. The adults have overwintered, and because it's been a very mild winter, then lots of them have done that successfully. They come out, they're looking for nectar, and the males are patrolling territories. Butterflies are surprisingly aggressive, and you'll see them chasing off other males as they battle up and down the garden. And they are defending patches of food plants, which in the case of the peacock is the nettle plant. So what are the defining characteristics of Lepidoptera? Well, again, let's look at Pandora's drawing. She's chosen the large white butterfly here. It isn't really a favorite with gardeners because it lays its eggs on brassicas, that's cabbages and cauliflowers and broccoli, and the larvae will eat those. So you can see the Lepidoptera means scale wings. And these have these opaque scaly wings, often with beautiful pigments on them. And if you're unlucky enough to have one trapped in your house or your shed and you try to release it, those scales often come off all over your hands as you're trying to help this thing. The mouth parts you can see are quite extraordinary. They've also got a very long proboscis, but it's not a piercing proboscis now. They stick that into flowers and lap up nectar. And it's coiled up when they're at rest, but they uncoil it and they can probe into flowers very actively and reach down deep into flowers with long corolla tubes to get the nectar right at the bottom. So if you have a plant in your garden with a very, very long tube, it's probably adapted to be pollinated by these guys. In at number three, perhaps surprisingly for those of you who think you know a lot about insects, are the coleoptera or beetles, who are famously supposed to be the most species rich group in the world. But they aren't the most species rich group in Britain, and it's possible that they're not the most species rich group in the world either. Because it's just that Victorian collectors really love beetles. Now this is a ladybird, a seven spot ladybird. That's a very common native ladybird that I'm sure you could find in your garden. And if we look at Pandora's drawing, we can see the wings again. So coleoptera means sheath wings, and the four wings in this case are not for flying. They've been hardened into wing cases to protect the hind wings. The hind wings are membranous, they do the flying. And if you let a butterfly, um, if you let a ladybird crawl at your finger, you'll see it take off from the top of your hand. It lifts up the four wings, unpacks the hind wings, and off it goes. And the mouth parts of the, of the beetles are often big, chewing mandibles so they can chomp their way through all kinds of other things. Ladybirds are called specialising on green flies, so they're definitely the gardener's friend. In at number two we have the diptera or flies. Now the diptera means the diptera, two wings. They don't really have two wings as we'll see in a moment. This is a rather fabulous example. You might think this is a bee but this is a bee fly and it's mimicking a bee. Lots of things do that because bees can sting you but this guy is harmless. You can tell he's not a bee because he's got his tongue stuck out and no self-respecting bee would not put their tongue away. Now here's a close-up of a fly. This is a fruit fly, a tiny little drosophila that is a friend of the geneticist and also you may find hanging around your bananas in your kitchen in the summer and you can see the wings much better. So you can see the four wings there are membranous, they do the flying. The hind wings are modified into something called a halter, and that's a little balance organ. And it moves out of phase with the wings and makes flies the supreme flyers. If you see something zipping past, stopping in midair, turning direction, you're looking at a fly. Even if it looks like a bee, no bee can fly as well as a fly can. 
The mouth parts are these just small dabbing mouth parts. Flies are famous for vomiting up enzymes onto their food to start digesting it before they lap it up, which doesn't make them very popular when they land on your dinner. And the final group with the most species in the UK are the Hymenoptera, which is the ants, bees and wasps. And this is a queen bumblebee. And the queen bumblebees hibernate over the winter. They emerge in the early spring. They've been living off their fat reserves and their ravenous. And they're whizzing around your garden looking for pollen and nectar and also a place to start a new colony. And they will rear the first generation of workers themselves. And once they have those and the queen won't leave home anymore, what's the point of being a queen if you have to do the work yourself? She'll send the workers out to collect more pollen to rear more workers and the colony will build and grow through the summer. And eventually they'll start to produce new queens and males at the end of the summer. So all the bees you're seeing now, if they're bumblebees, are female. What do they look like? Well, here's this beautiful drawing of a honeybee done by Pandora. You can see they often have a really pronounced waist. That's a really good way of knowing you're looking at a hymenoptera. They're all so busy and determined. They look like they know where they're going and they know what they're doing. There's no messing around for a bee, it's busy. And on the right there, you see the mouth parts again. A lot of hymenopterans actually have chewing mouth parts like ants, but the bees have got specially modified mouth parts for lapping up nectar. They're also collecting pollen. They're taking that back to rear their larvae. Pollen has lots of protein in it and is much better for building a new bee body. Nectar is just good for keeping something flying. It's just sugar, empty calories. Now, why a big five? Let's, is there a scientific question in here? It's often great to do some natural history and understand and learn some names, but why are these big five so successful? Do we have any insight into that? There are lots of insect orders out there. Well, really, it's a bit of a cheat saying a big five. It was just, you know, that goes with the safari idea. There's really a big four. The bugs are not nearly as species rich as the other four. Now, we don't know, and this is a suggestive thing, but it's interesting that those four groups that have so many species share something in common. And that is that they are the four groups that undergo a complete metamorphosis. And this is the garden tiger moth. And that is the caterpillar of the garden tiger moth. And we used to call them woolly bears when I was a kid. And they're rather attractive. They've really declined massively. You can't find them anything like as easily as I could as a child. But the caterpillar is totally different to the adult. So the egg is laid by the adult, the caterpillar emerges, grows, molts, chomps its way through leaves, and then pupates. And in that pupal stage, it completely reorganizes its body plan. It grows wings, it gets new mouth parts and emerges something, that moth on the right, fundamentally different. People didn't realize they were the same thing for quite a long time. And the adult is specialized on flying, sex, dispersal, and the insect and the, the larva, the caterpillar is specialized on building a body. And that means they can use totally different food sources and really optimize their use of the environment. And that might be why those four groups have become so successful. We don't really know. Now, I just want to finish by, if I can manage to play this video, perhaps I can't, so I, I, you'll have to go and watch my proper videos on YouTube if you want to see this clip. This was a solitary mining bee emerging from a lawn, my lawn. And I just wanted to end with a plea, really. If you have children at home, it is half term next week. Get them outside. Get them out there. It doesn't matter that you don't know what it is. It doesn't matter that you can't help them. You can encourage them. You can share your enthusiasm. You can find a book. You can find brilliant apps now to help you identify things. Some of them are really good, actually. And avoid that situation, which happened in my son's school, which one shown this mining bee. They were colonising the school playing field, which were then roped off. The children weren't allowed to go on there. They weren't allowed to go near them. They brought the council in to spray them. And then two weeks later, they had a PowerPoint presentation about the importance of pollinators. And this disconnect between biology as an academic subject and biology out there in the real world is something that we really have to try to break down, especially for children, but even for my students, frankly. Oh, well, that's annoying. So now it's started playing. So this is called Andrina Mitida, and it's the grey patched mining bee. And now she comes into focus and you can see she's really a beautiful insect. If you can find these little volcano-like structures in your lawn, that's what's making them. And they dig these little holes. You don't need to be frightened of them. Yes, they're Hymenoptera, they do have a sting, but it's incredibly mild, nothing like a honeybee sting or a bumblebee sting. Okay, so in order to help you get out there, we've produced this worksheet, which you can download from a website that I think there's a link to uh, next to this programme somewhere. 
And these are Pandora's drawings there together. And you could go out and try to find your bug five. So that idea was just what are the five insects, one from each of these groups that you can see in your garden and that you find particularly cool. And I chose the green shield bug, a peacock butterfly, something called a rose chafer, which is an incredible green metallic beetle, which I found a few weeks ago. A hoverfly that was doing a brilliant impersonation of a bumblebee and then the red-tailed bumblebee, which is one of our biggest queen bumblebees that I happen to find particularly attractive, but you know, you'll have your own favourites. And that's really the end. I'd just like to say thank you to Liam Crowley in the Department of Zoology. He's a proper entomologist. I should warn you before you start firing questions at me that I'm not really a proper entomologist. I'm just interested in all things biological. And he advised me on this film and Pandora Dewan, who did those wonderful drawings, and actually to all my students, former and current, who I am missing right now. And I hope that they are getting something from these films, and I hope they're managing to get out there a bit themselves and do a little bit of bug hunting, frankly, because it's good for the soul. And now I feel I should lend on this one, so to make you aware that there will be another talk next week from someone else. <laughs> Lindsay, that's certainly the case. We haven't finished with yours yet. Thank you so much for an absolutely fantastic lecture. And the fact you were saying at the end there that a lot of what you're talking about isn't your own direct research. I think in a way it says something that's actually quite typical of what Oxford research is about. It's about taking something we do, I hope, well, but in great depth, and then kind of connecting it to a wider kind of context rather than just being stuck in a lab or just being stuck in a library and trying to interpret it to others. And I think you've done that incredibly effectively today. So much so that I'm going to throw a poser at you, if I may, because that second one, the Lepidoptera, uh, I recognise that uh, you have butterflies and moths in that category. I have to say my closest acquaintance with the moth family tends to be when I look at a favorite sweater and see that large parts of it have disappeared over the uh, winter. I probably have to have to do something about that. But supposing I see something flapping around looking pretty in the house and I want to know if it's a harmless butterfly or a dead or a sweater deadly moth, how can I tell? Okay, well, that's a good question. Lots of people want to know what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth. And a general answer is difficult to give. But in Britain, it's reasonably easy. Now, the clothes moth you're talking about is one of the micro moths. So it's very tiny, actually. And no butterflies are that tiny. So if you see a really tiny thing that looks butterfly moth-like, it almost certainly is a moth. You can't go by the day flying thing. That's what a lot of people think. If it's flying in the daytime, it's a butterfly. If it's flying at night, it's a moth. Mm -hmm. But there are quite a lot of day flying moths. So I do have some specimens here with me ah. so, um, that I've brought along. You carry them with you always, Lindsay. I carry them with me always, yes. And I just want to say none of, nothing's been killed specially for this. And in fact, I've not killed any of these myself. But the Natural History Museum have allowed me to have a small teaching collection collected, sort of put together from what they call their dross drawers. So that's the various insect specimens that haven't quite cut the mustard aren't really useful for science, but are still useful for teaching. So that's why one of these things has got an antenna missing. I'll hope you can see this up here here. So this is the brimstone yep. butterfly. And that flies around a lot in spring. It's one of those real things where you know spring is here because you can see these wonderful yellow butterflies charging around. And I hope you can see that it's got what are called club antennae. And on mm. the other side there is the oak egger moth. That's a very beautiful moth. It's only got one antenna, I'm afraid. The other one's fallen off. But you can see, I hope, that's much more feathery. So that's, in the UK anyway, that works pretty well. Club antenna is a butterfly and those um, feathery antennae are a moth. Another way is that when they're at rest, a butterfly will quite often, unless it's really basking and trying to absorb sunlight, claps its wings up above its head. And moths don't do that. So that's another way that you can be sure it's a moth or a butterfly. Lindsay, thanks for that. We're getting a whole bunch of questions and I wish we had time to answer them all. We've only got about 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to choose some of, frankly, the, the ones that I think are most interesting here. Okay. Here's a really interesting one, which seems to me to mix biology and philosophy. So let's see if we can get that. Oh what, do we, what do we look like from the perspective of an insect? That's such a good question. Wow. Mm. Well, I think we look pretty scary. I mean, what I've been amazed by in trying to get footage of lots of insects in my garden to make these videos is how skittish they are. Mm -hmm. And some are really skittish and they're very aware of you looming and approaching towards them. And, and, and it's very difficult. You've really got to creep up on them. They have these amazing compound eyes, insects, of course. And so they don't resolve such a clear, they haven't got such a beautiful, clear image of the world as you. Mm. But their sensitivity to movement is much higher than yours. So you think that you're kind of, you know, if you want to swat a fly and you think you're moving at high speed, the fly who casts sees it like this. 
you know, it's like you're going in slow motion, which is why it's got no difficulty in avoiding your attentions, I'm afraid. So yeah, I guess we're these sort of big looming giants moving around in a very slow way. Interesting question. Well, I, interesting answer to a fascinating question. I, I, whoever sent that in, that, that's a good one. Here's one that I think all of us have been thinking about one way or another. We all know that massive insect death appears to be a huge part of the climate change emergency that's going on. We seem to have slightly forgotten about it because of pandemic uh, issues, but one disaster at a time. <laughs> what do you see happening in terms of insect life? And that's plant life more broadly, which of course is your other you know, main, main area. Um, what's happening now and you know what what can what if anything can we can we do about it well that's a huge question yeah i mean the, yeah. so the loss of biodiversity is the kind of second major environmental crisis that we face so the first is the climate change issue and of course they are interrelated as you mentioned but the second which is the loss of biodiversity is has been less appreciated until recently but i think politicians and the public generally are starting to recognize that that loss of biodiversity is going to have massive implications for the sustainability of the planet and for us as a species. If we can't survive alone, we need these other species to provide essential services, even if we want to just look at it in that way. Um, you know, for example, all these, these, these um, solitary bees are really important pollinators. Mm. Yes, there's been a lot of attention on that insect decline and lots of different papers backing up that finding. Um, and what can you do about it personally is to, is to uh, if you do have a garden, to let the insect life flourish in it. And that there are lots of great ways to do that and lots of advice and help on the web. It's partly about not being too tidy. Let patches of your lawn grow, don't mow them all the time, you know, and put up a bug hotel. I tell you what, those bee hotels in which solitary bees will come and nest are such fun to watch. Uh, so that, that's the kind of thing that you can do easily. It's a real kind of win-win. Off the back of what you just said, actually, Lindsay, I think that puts us in, in into another question that I think is, 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 is said with great urgency, I think not just for this question, but lots of us, which is any top tips for studying bugs with kids? And I think um, that's the subtitle we're not stated with, because we're really going crazy inside the house and we need to do our... Yeah. Yeah, totally. No, get out there. I mean, I think you know, that's the brilliant thing about insects. If you go outside, you're going to find one. They're not that hard to find. And I, I realise, and again, you know, I, I'm saying this as sort of the newly converted because I've also been locked up and wanting to make these videos. So I've gone out and seen lots of new things that I've never seen before. And the thing that's revolutionised it to some extent is your phone. Your phone's got a really good camera in it. You can take good pictures, you can take good video, and you can use that to help you identify things. And there's loads of people out there who want to help you. You know, there are all kinds of little trusts and organisations in Britain who've got brilliant guides on the web. I know this because I've been using them myself, which will help you to work out which bumblebee this is. You can post your photographs on various forums and loads of enthusiasts will help you tell you what it is. There, there really is a community of, of enthusiastic entomologists out there who want you to be interested in bugs. Uh, and, and this is a great time of year, perfect time of year for it. There's so much stuff out there. Of course, if you haven't got a garden, your local park mm. is just as good a place. Plenty of opportunities. And in fact, saying this is the right time of year brings up one that I, I'll just give you, the, um, uh, give you the question and feel free to take it any way you would like. Uh, if my house is full of flies in summer, does that mean flies are breeding indoors? And that's, I think, from a Mr. V. Dracula of Romania. Or, or not, as the case may be. Uh, could be. It depends if he really is Mr. V. Dracula of Romania. I think if he is, then probably that's the case. Yeah, I mean, they are a bit annoying when they come into your house. So there may be things that you've got, you know, obviously you've got to be a bit careful not to leave food out of your fridge for too long and this kind of thing. Um, if it's hoverflies and bumblebees, obviously I do try to put them out myself. Just get yourself a cup and a, pe and a cardboard get it against the window, slide the cardboard underneath and chuck them outside. I've rescued loads of bees like that. I've never been stung by one. Um, don't try to pick them up in your hand, obviously. Yeah, I don't know. They're a bit annoying. There was part, I used to live in Switzerland where there's masses of cows everywhere. And there's just flies everywhere. If you go to the mountains, every house is filled to the brim with flies. It's really strange. Well, I exactly, is sort of showing how uh, uh, climate and environment interact, interact in all sorts of ways, not always welcome, perhaps, but well worth, uh, well worth knowing. I think we're moving here from sort of intermediate to advanced league with some of these questions. So I'm going to throw them at you, just a couple of short but, uh, but, but interesting ones. Is it true, I do not know the answer to this question, please tell me, is it true that flies can only take off backwards? Oh, 
now. I wish I had Liam here. Ooh. I don't know. It sounds vaguely plausible. I, I know I can slay another myth. Well, th that may oh, not be a myth. Please but do. Definitely a myth that bumblebees, you know, engineers have shown that they can't. That's absolute rubbish, apparently. No engineer ever shown, showed that. And in fact, it's not really clear what the origin of that myth even ever was, whoever really started it. But no, whether or not, oh, that's very interesting. I don't know. Don't well, know the answer to that. Sorry. If you ever asked that question, you've given us a challenge to go and find out about after the lecture. So, you know, challenging the experts, always a good thing to uh, to do in this particular particular case. And that actually leads to another question that someone asked. And again, I think it may be with family activities in mind now that we're all allowed outside as much as we like, as long as we do social distance uh, and you know, this weather is going to in, encourage that, I think. What other resources would you recommend for further study in natural history? Well, I don't think you need much other than, a, than your phone. I say your phone is really brilliant and either a decent book or, or, or some of those phone apps uh, are a really excellent way to get started. And don't worry about having a tone for every occasion. That's what was great about my Spotter's Guide to Wildlife. If I was going out on a boat, it had a basking shark in it, and I was wandering around my park, well, it had plants in it. You know, just get started and don't worry too much about not knowing exactly what it is. Just starting to get close, being confident, oh, I think, you know, this is a hoverfly. There are loads of different ones. So getting some of these things right down to species is hard even for experts. That doesn't matter. You can still enjoy looking at it. Well, I like looking at them behave as well, not just identifying them. So I can just tell you right now, Leaf cutter bees have just started being active. And that, for the first time in my garden, I've, what, I've seen them. So if you see a funny little bee, it looks a little bit like a honeybee, but smaller, landing on some leaves, you're wondering what it's doing. In 10 seconds, it can chomp out a massive chunk of leaf and carry it off. And it is a really cool thing to watch. Uh, let me throw you in that case a question about bees that's come in as well, uh, Lindsay. Why are all bees called bees when their lives, honeybees, solitary bees, are so different? I guess it's a taxonomic thing. So I think that there is a taxonomic grouping, the bees, so they are more closely related to each other than they are to wasps or to um, ants, for example. That's my guess, but as again, I'm not an insect taxonomist, I'm not certain. It's true. I mean, so that phenomenon of eusociality, of building these colonies with lots of individuals in which only a very small number are actually allowed to reproduce, and lots of the others have to just help that individual, has evolved multiple times in that group. And we think of that as being the norm, but actually it's rare. So the majority of Hymenoptera are not social like that. And that's true. So all those solitary bees you're seeing, you are seeing half of them are female and half of them are male, and, and they just live their lives alone like lots of other animals. Absolutely. And I think we're going to have to run to the last question here, but it's kind of rather a, a fun one, uh, I think. It's about you and your uh, your work, Lindsay. Do you personally like all bugs and insects, I think, beyond that? Or do you dislike some because they eat the plants that you study? Well, that's right. Well, the truth is, though, of course, as a scientist, you can always make that interesting, right? So if you were studying some plant and that was your chosen thing and then you came along one day, something had been eating it, at least as an ecologist, I could probably make that the focus of my study and that would be OK. It is a problem in the glass houses in the department where we have people studying the molecular biology of plants and they're rearing large numbers of them in greenhouses. They don't want the bugs in. So we sometimes have some conflict there. We're not really allowed to bring any bugs into our department in case we infest the greenhouses. But no, I like most of them. I think you can find a good side. I think the one thing I've met, which isn't an insert, which I really didn't like was a leech, a blood sucking leech in Southeast Asia. It's hard to like those. Okay, well, perhaps that's the challenge for the next time. Learn to love the leech. Now, there's a bumper sticker when we're actually uh, allowed to be out and about again that people can uh, can get behind. Lindsay you've, given us, Lindsay, you've given us a tremendous talk, tremendous amount of very, very useful and lively response to a lot of questions that have come from all directions about bugs and about beetles. And really, I think, shown us an insight into just a small part of the huge range of the wonderful research that's being done at Oxford. So thank you so much for that and I'm sure I'll speak on behalf of the of the audience and for everyone listening I hope you'll join us next week and indeed in successive weeks for this continuing series of Oxford at Home. The next event is going to be on Friday 29th of May. It's going to be on the early years of Rembrandt, an exhibition currently well, not running at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford because of course the doors are shut but a fascinating one none the, uh, the less. And if you want to find more details the webs the web page um, uh, is found in the description just below the video that you'll see here on YouTube. Thank you all for watching. Do come back soon from Oxford at home, and I hope that we'll have plenty more of these conversations 
do keep them coming. Thank you.